Good morning. Um, this is Women Leaders in Action, episode number two, Self-Compassion. Um, in our midst today is our guest, Abba Gaysoanda. Um, Abba is a hope monger, she calls herself. She has an MBA and an MA, LMHC. She's a Christian therapist, an author, and transformational speaker. She's the principal of Chrysalis Counseling and Coaching, a private counseling practice. She says, my heart cry is to promote mental, emotional, and spiritual health by educating, inspiring, and ultimately elevating people to harness the amazing power of hope in their lives. Abba is blessed with a teaching gift that compels women to rediscover themselves, restore their spiritual and emotional harmony, and rebuild healthy relationships. The constant theme in Abba's life and career has been her concern for the well being of others and her love for imparting information and new insights to encourage people to live authentic, rewarding, purpose filled lives. Abba is a passionate mental health advocate and is the director of Health and Well Being International, an NGO aimed at mental health education and promotion. Abba is also the author of the best selling book, Reflections of a Hope Monger. She is the host of the Hope Mongers podcast, ranked as a top 5% podcast globally. She is currently working on her second book, Letters of Hope to My Younger Self, to be released in February 2023. Uh, Women Leaders in Action is honored to have Abba with us today. Now, a brief background about Women Leaders in Action. Um, it was started in 2012 as a group, a support group of sorts by women from five countries. Our mission is to empower women for success through personal and professional development, mentoring, promoting diabetes awareness and community outreach projects. In 2014, we decided to take it up a notch and um, Women Leaders in Action became a nonprofit entity. Welcome, Abba, and good morning to everyone. Good morning, good morning. I hope everybody is doing well. I'm going to share my screen now and then and then begin. Um, okay, so you know a little bit um, about this topic I'm going to talk about, you know, as women, we are nurturers and I think we're also socialized to grow up and just take care of everybody. But what that sometimes can mean is that we take care of everybody else and everything else at the expense of ourselves, you know. And, and, and even that even notion and aspiration to be a superwoman doesn't help either. We just keep going, 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 doing, doing, doing without paying attention to ourselves. And I, I, I don't know if anybody wants to contribute here, but do you remember the first time you recognized that you weren't treating yourself gently? And if you do, please, you know, you know let, let me know. For me, just now as I was sitting here, I remember I was about eight years old and I was combing my hair. My mother was around. And then she said to me, oh, you don't treat your hair gently at all. And it's funny because since then, whenever I'm not treating myself gently, for some strange reason, I think about that, you know, um, um, you know encounter with my mom, just observing me comb my hair impatiently, trying to get the, the you know, the thick, uh, you know, um, peshi. What is the, the English word for queen that, that, that Of course, of course. Of course, <laughs> that is it, nappy, right? And not even taking time to really, you know, get the stuff out. But that's how I, I tended to be with myself, you know? Self-compassion is a notion that honestly, for me personally, is relatively, you know, recent. Um, and so I want to ask everybody, and I know there's only four of us here, so I'm hoping at least I get one or two to you know, contribute. Think about the last time you made a mistake. It could have even been in the last hour, all right? I want you to think about what is the first thing you did or you thought when you realized you'd made that mistake. And I've tried to almost con to condense the answers. Number one, you silently kicked yourself or told yourself off. Or no, you suddenly kicked yourself. Number uh, B, you actually kicked yourself. C, you cursed at yourself. What is wrong with you? Are you crazy, silly, stupid? Or D, you immediately began to encourage yourself. I know there's three other people in addition to me. 
Personally, I have to admit I did see, use the harsh word against myself. Sister Laura, Sister Rosemont, Sister Judy, tell me. I think I'll start off quickly by saying, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Laura Jangba, uh, president of Women Leaders in Action. And I'd also like to acknowledge executive board members who are here on the screen, Akosia Sewa Boadu, the vice president of WLA, and also Judy, the chief of staff, Judy Sensil is the chief of staff. I don't know if someone else is on with us, but I would like to acknowledge them. And I thank you for joining us. And I'll go first. This morning, as I put things together for this event, we were having technical difficulties, moving things around. And I said, oh my God, why didn't I do this last night? But we did do it last night, but today there were still difficulties. So yes, I picked myself <laughs> this yeah, morning. I, why didn't I do it? What <laughs> behind the, you know, behind even the words you, whether those were the words you used or not, behind it is like, ah, but you've made another mistake. What is wrong with you? Are you not competent? Am I right? That's those right. are <laughs> spoken words, even behind the words we speak to ourselves. Yeah. You know, Miss Rosemont, Miss Judy, do you want to share? Sure, I, I'll share next. I think I do a combination. First, I curse myself, and then I say, "Okay, let's get it together and let's do it right." So, I, I but I always start out with, you know, cursing at myself before I I kind of say, "Okay, stop, let's do it right." Right. Yes. And Sister Rosemont, I actually silently kind of kick myself and talk to myself. That you know, I, I, I actually correct myself and punish my own self in my own way. Yes, exactly. And, I, and I, I'm glad you said that because punishing ourselves, we, we somehow we, we have it in our brains that we have to be self critical in order to motivate ourselves. But it's a misguided notion. You know, I have to, I have to crack the whip on myself and that will galvanize me into action. I have to tell myself off, you know, it is a wrong notion. So self-criticism, let me get rid of the, uh, okay. Self-criticism is the act of thinking negatively about yourself. And individuals who tend to be self-critical actually create more problems with themselves by being harsh with yourself, you know, and, and by internalizing negative, you know, images of yourself. And because of that, it actually makes you less confident, less, you know, um, willing to try new things. Self-criticism actually holds us back in life, you know. So here are some examples. And of course, as long as, as much as the day is long, we can come up with statements that are self-critical. And you know, the thing is, if you pay attention to your self-talk, it might not come out immediately. You might not recognize it, but if you take a minute, to sometimes analyze the meaning behind some of their words. Ah, but what is wrong with you? You know, you realize that, wow, somewhere along the line, I'm keep telling myself I'm not good enough. I don't deserve to be where I am. Nobody likes me. I might end up alone. I'm not good enough. I'm stupid. I'm a failure. I can't do anything right. I will never get better this situation will never get better. And we keep beating ourselves and beating ourselves and beating ourselves. In the meantime, our brain keeps on releasing all these stress hormones, cortisol, right? Uh, the, the ones that prepare us for fight or flight. So we are the aggressor, but then we are the victim of our own selves. And then we are chewing ourselves up and binding ourselves into, into this state of anxiety and not being able to almost move forward in certain ways. And the good thing is that many of us catch ourselves and let's continue to practice recognizing that maybe the first thought is critical, but you know what, let me change it with my, my subsequent thoughts. You know, obviously the goal is, let me get to a place where even if I mess up, my first thought can be a compassionate one. I'm still on that journey, you know? So does self-criticism motivate us? Absolutely not. In the same way, when you tell off a child harshly, the child will hang, hang his, his, his head in shame and be almost immobilized for a period while it's in their, in their minds. That is what self-criticism does to us, whether it's even for seconds at a time. But imagine every time you think a negative thought, being paralyzed for seconds over the days and weeks and months and years of your life, it adds up. 
it adds up and impacts us. And so this, you know, uh, studies have shown that self-criticism does result in low self-esteem, feeling of worthlessness, um, perfectionism, which is not a good thing because the perfectionist feels I always have to have a perfect result. Otherwise I am not worthy, you know? And so perfectionism, you know, it goes hand in hand with self-criticism. We don't believe we are worthy. And we keep telling ourselves of lack of self-motivation and, and a whole host of other things. Self-criticism is not a good thing at all, at all. All right. And, and, and I think I'm not asking anyone to talk now and whoever, whoever is listening either live or later on, I, I invite you to reflect on the different ways, both the things you've said to yourself and the things you've done to yourself that has resulted in being harsh with yourself, judgmental of yourself, rejecting of yourself. Honestly, I've realized that sometimes it comes down to even allowing myself to eat healthy, making time for myself for self-care. You know, all of these ways, think about all of the ways you personally have been harsh judgmental and rejecting of yourself. What has it cost you? And I think obviously then, you know, the aim of my presentation is what am I willing to do differently so I can be kinder to myself? Because that is important. You know, the root of self-criticism is shame. And the definition of shame, it's an intensely painful feeling that emanates from the belief that we are flawed and worthy of love and belonging. An intense pain that emanates from a belief that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. Imagine you criticize yourself based on that root of shame. However many times a day we are harsh with ourselves over the weeks, over the months, over the years, over the course of our lifetimes. Why do we keep beating ourselves up? That's the question I ask myself. Do I, do I deserve more? Yes, I do, from myself. And you know, Brene Brown made that statement about shame. One thing Brene Brown, I read from one of her books and it, it floored me until I realized it was true is she said, the most compassionate people are actually compassionate with themselves first. Otherwise, we're actually not being authentic. So many of us, if we actually catch ourselves, that supposed compassion we are showing to others, you know, truly, is it coming from a, an authentic place when we don't know how to show it to ourselves? We must be compassionate towards ourselves because you know what? All of us, all of us are flawed. All of us are worthy of care. We don't need to be special or above average or a winner to be worthy of care. You know, and what I tell people is we are human beings, not human doings. So often, and I know for me, the first 40 years of my life, I went through life trying to go from goalpost to goalpost achievement to achievement, because I guess in my head, I hadn't realized it, it was a proxy for worthiness. You know, for anybody listening, if you never did another awesome thing, you are still worthy of love, of care, of compassion. You are special because you are a being created by God in his image and likeness. And it's from that place that we, can, we, we then aspire to do excellent things in the name of the one who created us. But we don't do these things to show that we are worthy. We do these things because we understand that the one who created us loves us and has made us worthy. And therefore it's our job to also make the world a better place. That's such an important uh, piece of information to have. Any questions so far? Well, before we take any questions, I'd like to acknowledge in our midst, uh, Women Leaders in Actions, um, Advisory Board Member, Dr. Ruby Firesay. Dr. Ruby Firesay, we welcome you to this forum. Thank you. Thank you. So self-compassion, you know, in the way it's manifested, is actually no different than being compassionate towards somebody else. And that is a little bit easier for us, especially as women. We've been socialized to be nurturers, to care for people. 
And so when we are compassionate towards somebody else, here are five things that happen. Number one, you notice that the person is suffering. Number two, you feel moved with compassion because they are suffering. You know, number three, you then make a decision to respond to the person's pain with encouragement, warmth, a desire to help the suffering person. You offer them understanding and kindness, even though they failed or even though they may have made a horrible mistake. What you don't do is judge them harshly. And then you even encourage them because you realize that, you know what, suffering, failure, imperfection, we all experience it. It is part of the human experience. Any one of us could be a step away from committing whatever it is that we are, we are encouraging the other person there, but for the grace of God, go I. And so because of that, we are able to be compassionate. This is the same process we must take to be compassionate towards ourselves. Number one, notice that we are suffering. So many of us don't even give ourselves the space, the, the, the care to even say, what am I experiencing? You know, and, and we've all gone through things. Maybe it could even be who somebody posted on, on Facebook. I, I don't even, you know, people follow me on Facebook and some people I don't know personally. And she had said something about, uh, oh gosh, I wish I had, I had uh, taken a screenshot. She was hurting and she just posted. She said she, her, her ex-husband from 10 years ago, and I guess maybe he was abusive. She was because I hated him. And therefore I tried to take something to abort the baby. And, and now the baby is 10 years old and can only read two letter words. And, I, and, I, and then I get, and when I keep trying and, and she can't learn, I get angry at her and I hate myself. You know, um, she is suffering. And I didn't know her, but I posted something encouraging to her. You know, we, I was moved by the suffering to respond with, with warmth, understanding, kindness. And so many people did as well. They even said, you know what, why don't you go research um, autism? Maybe your baby is autistic. Maybe it's not because of this. People encouraged her, you know what, God is merciful. And she said, oh, you know, I'm, I'm starting to feel better. The, the group of people just saying nice things to her, pouring into her, made her feel better. Nobody I looked on the thread said, hey, what did you take to try and abort the pregnancy? And told her off in that moment. Because in that moment, they recognized that this was somebody in pain. You know, well, that's what we must do to ourselves too. That is the process of being self-compassionate. All right, self-compassion means we are acting the same way towards ourselves as we would towards somebody else. When we're having a difficult time, when we fail or when we notice something, some character traits we don't like about ourselves. When we are self-compassion, we don't ignore our pain. We, 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 we acknowledge it, identify it. A caregiver, you may love, you know, a, a, a good friend of mine, um, her husband has early onset Alzheimer's. He had to retire early. It is tough for her. And she shared, you know, some, some, some way she was feeling. I know she loves her husband. I know they had a wonderful marriage and she absolutely loves him. But the realities of being a caregiver is tough. You know, so to even, you know, for me to witness and be there as she spoke some of those things she was feeling without judgment, that was compassion. Well, do we allow us to do that for ourselves? You know, instead of mercilessly judging and criticizing ourselves, self-compassion means we are kind, understanding, whatever we go through. Another definition of self-compassion is this. It is a way, you know, and this is a, a, a lifetime thing. It should be a way of relating to ourselves kindly and embracing who we are, flaws and all. So it's not self-esteem, it's closely linked to self-esteem. Self-esteem means I'm telling myself I'm wonderful, I'm awesome, I'm this, I'm that, I'm that. Self-compassion is, you know what, whatever I am in this moment, however I messed up, I'm going to acknowledge what I've done, acknowledge how I'm feeling with kindness. And I'm going to embrace myself, understanding that, you know what, I'm not some horrible standalone person. To be honest with you, weakness, flaws is part of the human condition. And so in this moment, I, I understand and I see myself for who I am, but I'm choosing to relate to myself 
kindly. That is self-compassion. And you know, self-compassion has been studied extensively by psychologists. So there's some, a lot of very strong data. It is linked to mental well-being. People who are too hard on themselves can end up depressed. Self-compassion is strongly related to happiness, life satisfaction. It's related to less depression, less anxiety, less stress, less perfectionism. If we are gentle with ourselves, we will have a happier ride in this world, despite the issues that life can bring. Kristin Neff, who is the, 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 the world's leading uh, authority on, on, on research on self-compassion, she found that there's three elements to self-compassion. Three elements. Number one, and I've talked about that at length, self-kindness. Even when you fail to be able to relate to yourself with kindness. And then there's also something called common humanity. Because sometimes when we make a mistake, we characterize ourselves as I'm the worst person who ever lived. Nobody has made a worse mistake than me. And that's not true. The Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. And so if you, you, you have a flaw, if you failed, well, it just means you are human. So give yourself a, a little bit of leeway. I am human. I made a mistake. Now, how can I rise up? And then the third element of self-compassion is this thing called mindfulness. Even when you have a thought, so there are some thoughts that you have, eh? sometimes it's difficult to verbalize it because somebody would say, wow, why would Abba, with all her knowledge and all her so-called hope monger, express such a thought? But you know what? We all have them. Self-compassion says, I'm not going to judge myself. I'm going to notice the thought I'm having without judgment. Understanding that is coming from a place of maybe pain. And I'm going to allow myself to feel compassion for myself in that moment. You see, we are all on a journey. We don't start out from the beginning to, to that desired end point just like that. There is a journey. And sometimes along that journey, we may all have some crazy thoughts. We may all have some crazy feelings, some non-palatable things that if people knew about might judge us, maybe. But the, the important thing is we shouldn't judge ourselves. Let's see where we are and then try and understand where that is coming from. And the Bible has a lot to say about self-compassion. And I wanted to add that faith-based as well. You know, Proverbs 19 says this, to acquire wisdom is to love yourself. Wow, wise people love themselves. Ephesians, Paul says this, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body. So we think about as women, I know when my kids were growing up, I think for a long time, I used to eat leftovers, right? As opposed to take time, take time to figure out, okay, what are my needs? Now I'm a woman in menopause, you know, and the hot flashes, right now I'm sitting here with a fan underneath, that's a, my little act of self-compassion. But you know, it should factor in my, my needs, my physical needs because of this stage in my life, my mental health needs. I should take time to understand what my body is going through and to nourish myself. Again, the Bible says this. And then finally, this was an interesting one. I think when I first became acquainted with the notion of self-compassion, this Bible verse stood out to me. All my life, love your neighbor as yourself. I only understood it as, let me love my neighbor really well. And then when I began to understand self-compassion, I was like, oh, so the way I love my neighbor really well, Abba, I need to love me really well too. So it is a powerful, powerful verse. Love your neighbor really well. Love yourself as well, really well. All right. So um, yeah, so I'm going to say, what time is it now? All right. I'm trying to be mindful of time. So this it looks like it might be a complicated um, diagram, but this is actually summarizes the research of, of, of the world's leading research on self-compassion. So I don't know if you can see my, um, my KESA, right? Self-compassion is the key that opens the door to a happy life. Research has found this. 
Okay, and so how, what are the elements of self-compassion? There's three elements, one, two, and three, as I mentioned. Number one is being kind to ourselves, as kind to ourselves as we are to others. Number two, recognizing that flaws, mistakes, falling short, it is part of the human condition. And somebody who is compassionate with themselves, when they make a mistake, they will say in their head, I made a mistake, how can I do it better? Somebody who's not kind to themselves, when they make a mistake, they'll say, I am a mistake, I am unique, I'm messed up, I'm screwed up. Whether they use those exact words or not, that is what they tell themselves. No, you are awesome, you are human. Yes, humans are flawed. And in this instance, you made a mistake like a human, but you can rise up. And so uh, recognizing that we are human allows us to even maintain a connection with others. When you feel like you are alone in your sin or your transgression, you will isolate. And the isolation will then fuel depression, anxiety, and so on. And then of course, the third element of self-compassion is this element of mindfulness, understanding that I am here. This is where I am, you know? This is where I am. In this moment, I'm feeling irritable. I'm feeling resentful. Does it mean that I'm a horrible person, stand alone, a fake therapist who talks about hope and she's feeling, no, it means in this moment, this is where I am. And I'm acknowledging how I'm feeling, knowing that I can then figure out how to come out of this. Also, it means I'm not exaggerating it too. Oh my goodness, what I'm going through is, is so huge and I'll never rise up, I'll never get better. I'm not doing that to myself. I'm recognizing where I am. Self-compassion means that I don't have to feel like I have to be above average or superlative in everything, a winner, the number one world's number one wife, mother, professional, to be worthy. No, it's, not, it's, it's understanding that intrinsically, right? I am worthy and deserving of love. And when I make a mistake or when I have a wrong thought, I can acknowledge it with compassion and I can treat myself with kindness. So one way, one amazing way to practice self-compassion is affirmations. Because if you hadn't realized, for most of what I'm saying, it's self-criticism starts with the self-talk. Do we agree? Those things we say to ourselves, I'm not worthy, I'm not good enough, I'm gonna fail and this and that. And so, you know what, there's different ways to do affirmations. Number one, I encourage everybody who's listening to this, in the next, in the coming days, have, you have a little journal. And if you catch yourself thinking a negative, harsh thoughts against yourself, write it down. You know, try and gather a list of maybe the most common things, negative self-talk that you say to yourself. And then uh, try and write a, 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 an opposing statement that is kind to yourself. So instead of saying, I'm a failure, you know, you can say something like, I'm a work in progress and I will be okay or something. And so for every negative thing, thought you've caught yourself saying, try and write an opposing self-compassionate statement. Google it, self-compassionate statements and have a, a list of them. And then let me tell you, say them to yourself. There's different ways. In this picture here, the guy has posted notes with his affirmation. Some people will do that on their mirrors and they'll do that. Some people have it written down and every day, morning and night, they'll say it, or at least once a day. I have found it effective when I record my affirmations and then listen to it. You know, it's interesting. Um, the brain waves before, right before we fall asleep, they are theta waves. And theta waves actually um, are like, almost like at that hypnosis level. So the things you listen to right before you fall asleep and right when you wake up, they, 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 they kind of go deep into your subconscious. And so there are some people who will record their affirmations and play it till, till they fall asleep. You can even go on YouTube and you can find eight hours worth of affirmations, right? That people have put out there and they say, just listen to it and fall asleep. Or whether it's a hymn, a worship song, a, 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 the Bible, when we, whatever we listen to, you know, even when we're not paying strict attention, it can actually enter 
and go deep, you know? And I can't even tell the, the, the number of people I'm so depressed. I feel so anxious. What am I listening to? And then they'll play, even teenagers, they'll, be, they'll play, they'll, they'll, they'll show me their playlists and their songs, their lyrics, you know? You know, there's nothing to me, there's nothing inconsequential, personally. And so you have to be very careful. I'm, I'm, I'm watching a show on TV called Snapped about people who snap and kill their spouses. And I just listen to it. It's on repeat till I fall asleep. Or I'm listening to something about Jeffrey Dahmer, that serial killer, and I'm watching it till I, I mean, maybe I'm a little bit on there, very careful about what I, I, I allow to enter into my headspace. But, you know, ask yourself as a matter of habit, what, you know, noise, what messages am I allowing to enter into my headspace? Are they fueling self-criticism or are they reminding me of who I am? so that I can wake up poised to take on the day, being kind to myself. These next few slides I lifted from my mental health presentation because the very same things we're going to use to look after our mental health will also help us to be compassionate with ourselves. So you know what, keep a regular routine. Sometimes I think as women, we almost feel uh, satisfied when we can say I'm overworked, I'm overworked. I did this and went here and I got up and I did breakfast and this and got the kids ready and overworked. You know what? Keep a regular routine. Give yourself time for things you enjoy. It's okay to take a rest. It's okay to, you know, spend a day to yourself, by yourself. Those are all ways we can be compassionate with ourselves. Eat healthy. You know, take your vitamins. Limit caffeine. Look after you. Exercise. Let yourself sleep. These are all ways in which we can be compassionate with ourselves. Deep breathing. Watch who you talk to. Sometimes that there are people in our lives, you talk to them, you feel so low. Be compassionate with you. Even if sometimes that person is a blood relative, you know, you can love them and set a boundary as well. We can love our family members, but if somebody is, uh, uh, has a, a way of being that when you talk to them, you feel aggravated. Understand that you're not being kind to yourself by exposing yourself to their vitriol. So you can set a boundary and love them from a distance. Self-compassion is about setting boundaries so you can look after yourself. And of course, and I, and I know Laura, at some point you're bringing in someone to talk about meditation, deep breathing. We don't have time in, in this space to talk about that, but that is another major way of of self-care and, and being compassionate with ourselves, just allowing ourselves to sit and breathe and process our emotions. You know, when we are compassionate with somebody, we give them the space, the time to hear them out and encourage them. No difference than if we are compassionate with ourselves. So that was my presentation. I hope it was useful. I know there are questions, so I was dying to edge in with the questions. Thank you so much uh, for the awareness. Um, and how about one of the questions that people have when it comes to self-compassion is, a lot of times we focus on other people and fail to realize that we need to focus on ourselves. As they say on the plane, when you board the plane, you need to put on your oxygen mask first before you can help anybody else. So when does one realize that one needs to take off oneself because sometimes we just keep going, 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 going. So we can go no more. Yeah, that's a great question. I think when does one realize as a general question now, let's take care of ourselves now. I think for, for me, what helps me is let me set time in my schedule, ring fence time in my schedule for my self care. So if I say to myself, I am going to go walking for 20 minutes in the mornings. Then let me ring fence the time. So, so in my calendar, I, I, I have my time to go exercise. You know, I even have time, I call it show up for myself time. It's my time I'll plan what I have going on or just catch up with, with, with my own kind of life. You know, if for you going for a massage once a month is good, schedule it. Our lives are so busy. If you don't schedule things, they don't happen. So schedule it. I think another way, everybody has, you know, what works for them, but to allow yourself to focus on yourself, journaling is a really powerful tool. 
So tell yourself, you know what, I'm going to journal maybe. What is my time of day I want to journal? My personally, my, um, my, my promise to myself is every day I'll journal, even if it's a one sentence. I don't put pressure on myself. If there's a day I want to write two pages, four pages, fine. If it's just one sentence, fine. There are many, many days when all I'll write is a question to God. God, how about this? But it's, it, it's my thing I'm doing for myself. You know, me, my self-care and avoiding self-criticism. I, lo I love my little lashes. So I treat myself. Why not? <laughs> I like it. You know, and so, and so, yes, and of course, a big one, you know, for self-criticism as opposed to self-care um, is watch yourself talk. We must be mindful. And that's why mindfulness is a big part of, um, of self-compassion. Because when you are mindful, you are paying attention to yourself, what you are saying, sometimes the meaning behind the things you are saying, and you are being um, intentional to then, how can I replace those things? You know, let's not forget that we were created in this image and likeness. And the way God created the world, if we believe the Bible story, he began to visualize and say, let there be light. Let there be water. Let there be birds that fly and beasts that crawl. I'm paraphrasing. And as he spoke, these things began to happen. Well, then he created us in his image and likeness. So what are you saying into your atmosphere? What are you saying to yourself? So often we unwittingly are the aggressor and the victim. Of our, and, and then we, we, and, and we, we wrap ourselves, we bind ourselves into this thing. Let's not do that to ourselves. It's a good time to change. It's a good time to schedule, you know, things in our lives to allow us to be compassionate to ourselves. Self-care is self-compassion. Thank you, Abba. Any other questions from the group? Hi, Abba, thank you very much. That was really interesting. I was just curious because I've been reading recently about the fixed mindset and the growth mindset. And some of the stuff you've talked about kind of reminds me of people who have the growth mindset in terms of being self-compassionate and stuff. But I was wondering whether you could also relate this to those who have a fixed mindset and what they can do in terms of be more compassionate to themselves. Yeah, I think first of all, even, and that's a really good question. Thank you, Dr. Ruby. I don't have the, um, the image in front of me, um, but the thing about fixed mindsets is they think what I am is what I'll always be in essence. And I think one important way is just educate yourself. There's some people who don't even realize that there's something called fixed mindsets and growth mindsets. And so even, you know, realizing the book is by, I think her name is Carol Dwyer is, is the, the, the name of the author, yes. right? Uh, <laughs> listen, um, anybody listening, go buy the book, get a couple of girlfriends and do a book club, read together. That's what I do. I have a couple of, uh, in my case, they are my cousins. We get together and we, we read, you know, and we discuss. Um, so yes, do that and, 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 and familiarize yourself with that. I think that's important. Um, but yes, a fixed mindset can really keep you stuck where you are. Can really keep you stuck where you are and it doesn't have to be. We are all evolving. I, for one, I want to get better and better every day. Any other questions from the group? Ms. Judy, Ms. Akosia, no questions at <laughs> this time. So I'm maybe just, just, sorry, go ahead, Akosia. No, I'm just enjoying the talk so much. I am in a whole different room, so, I, I'm, I'm a good listener at this time. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so, um, Echo Acosta. Thank you, Baba. Everything was um, very well spoken and I, um, I'm just enjoying what you're saying and just taking it all in. Thank you. Since mm -hmm. we don't have too much time, I'll just go oh, ahead. Hold on, Sister Ruby was gonna say something that I have oh, something sorry. to Well, yeah. No, Abba, I was just going to say that I, I think one point you've made, and I'd like you just to emphasize that I think for women, we especially, you know, you use the word too hard on ourselves. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we end up even being not just hard on ourselves, but on, on other women colleagues, especially when we're working with them, because you expect them to, you know, really uh, perform. And, you know, in your experience, you know, 
what would you say to women who are in that situation and, and have, you know, like um, either white colleagues or even family members who are pushing them because they're saying you should, you know, be able to achieve these things so that you can have it all. And, and I believe that a, a woman, we shouldn't expect to have it all because it's impossible to have it all, but some people have that mindset. So what is the advice you'd give to them? Yeah, I think you can't have it all at the same time, right? That there will be times, I know in my life, when work is really going well, but, you know, there's so many dishes in the sink, you know, at the same time. So you can't have it all. I think that, you know, and I said something, but I read from Brene Brown, the most compassionate people are compassionate with themselves. You can't give what you don't have. So if you're too hard on people, then ask yourself, all right, let me go back and look at me. You know, and listen, sometimes even with our kids, they, they, you know, our experience doesn't have to be theirs. Just because we went through a certain thing doesn't mean that we have to expect them. I'm not saying let's go easy on them and let them just coast through life. But sometimes we want them to experience the same hardships that we did. And it doesn't have to be. You know, we can actually be effective in life and, and successful in life without the harshness. And I think that even if, when we go deep into it, there's so many implications from colonialism and, and so on and so on, where the harshness comes from. It doesn't have to be so. The, again, the research has shown it's not beating ourselves with a whip to make us more successful. Actually, it's being kind to ourselves. So I think the more we educate ourselves, the more we do things to be kind to ourselves, hopefully, we can do that for other people. And in any case, isn't it narcissistic of us to assume we know what a person wants, another woman wants? Mm -hmm. Think about it. So, you know, for me, when all these things happen, it all comes, it comes back for me to look within. Why do I feel I have to judge another woman's choice? I don't. Whether you choose to be a fully career, fully homemaker, some kind of, I don't judge anybody because everybody has a different level of support system. You know, so no, we don't have a, a, a say in somebody's life. Our job is to be compassionate to ourselves and to be, use our feminine energy to be the best leader that we are called to be. And I think even being not self-compassionate takes, and maybe you guys are familiar with the negative, the, the feminine energy and the masculine energy that as, as females, we all have, but if you don't use your energy the right way, it comes across as just aggressive, aggressive, aggressive does not motivate the people around you, so. Thanks for that. And I think this might be the last question given that time is not our friend, but I would, I, I figured it would be good to touch on this for anybody going through the same thing. And how do you, um, for lack of a better term, recommend self-compassion when you're grieving? Recently, I lost my mother and uh, she has lived with me for 28 years. I was her primary caretaker. Actually, tomorrow will be her birthday. Her 82nd birthday, she has lived with us. The most difficult part of that was that given that I was taking care of her, I had to withdraw and do me as they say. But then the culture resents that sometimes because people want to be there for you because that is the culture. People want to come, you know, hug you. But then for my self-compassion was withdraw and retreat because I'm an introvert for lack of a better term. How do you, um, Cope with that. What is the coping mechanism you recommend in that situation? Well, I think you know the beautiful thing about the way we are we are growing. We are probably everybody here is in their fifties or, or close to it. I'm thirty eight. <laughs> we 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 can make our choices for ourselves, and and the big part of self compassion is knowing what I need to feel good and what I need may be different from what you need, Laura, what you need, Judy, what you need, Ruby, but we all need to figure out what is my specialized, customized things that make me feel good. For somebody is going hiking in the mountains. For, for me, is sitting on the beach and watching the sunrise. You know, for somebody, let me have a big party with all my friends around me. For somebody too, it's like, I need to do my own thing. So we need to go into ourselves I give everybody permission, not that I give you, it was always your permission in the first place. Go into your, figure out what do I need? What are my needs to make myself feel whole again? How do I regroup? 
the only thing is by all means retreat, just do not isolate for long periods of time because isolation in itself is a negative mental health indicator. But by all means retreat, by all means, you don't see, we don't have to pick up every phone call. We literally, you don't have to pick up every phone call. You don't have to answer every email in the moment. When you are ready, you can go ahead and do it. You know, what stops any of us from shutting off your phone and taking a day to yourself? Nothing. So do it. Do it. We don't owe anybody anything. Maybe only the bank, but they're not in my personal lives. <laughs> no, for real, right? Shut that off your phone correct. and do you. We don't have to please everybody. Even the Paul said it. If I should yet please men, I shouldn't be a servant of Christ. You know, you cannot, Bob Marley too said it. You cannot please all the people all the time. So you know what? Be true to yourself. Figure out what you need and flow. Trust me, the world will not stop because you took time for yourself. And trust me, you will not lose your relationships because you took time for yourself. The men do it, do they not? <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> the men do it, they have no problem taking time and watching their soccer or whatever they have going on, you know? So yeah. Okay, on that note, uh, time is always the enemy, as it said. So I would like to thank you, Abba, for coming on. We really appreciate you, Abba Kato Ander. And I also like to thank um, Women Leaders in Action. Our mission is to empower women for success through personal and professional development, mentoring, promoting diabetes awareness and community outreach projects. I'd like to thank again our executive board members and our advisory board members, our volunteers, our ambassadors. We're here because of you, our donors, our sponsors. And uh, we thank you every day. And we hope you will join us for these monthly episodes our next one will be about gratitude next month. So we hope to see you here. Thank you. It's been a great day. Enjoy the weekend. And remember, in the words of Les Brown, you are too blessed to be stressed. On that note, women leaders in, um, uh, women leaders in action, empowering women for success. Thank you very much. Have a great day.